announcements, which brings us to tonight's speaker. Uh, so this is Hunting for the Most Distant Galaxies of All. This is presented by Ethan Siegel. Um, do you want to go ahead and take it away, Ethan? I have you, uh, let me stop my share here. And you should be able to share your screen. Uh, yeah, let's see if it works. Okay. And let's see if this works. All right. Uh, so can people see my screen? Yep. Yep. I'm good. Yep. Fantastic. All right. Well, uh, thank you for bringing me here. Uh, thanks to uh, thanks to Bob and Eric for all the logistics for getting me here. And uh, um, yeah, I want to say uh, thank you to the Amateur Amateur Astronomer Association of Pittsburgh for inviting me. You know, I think that uh, that people out doing amateur astronomy are uh, super like. I'm so glad you guys do what you do because I benefit from it tremendously and it is a skill and talent that I myself do not have. I, uh, I, I love looking up at the stars. I love taking out a pair of binoculars. Um, but the bigger we go, I find the less I do it. And so like those of you who have in your areas, uh, set up big telescopes for other people to look through. I'm one of the people coming to look through them because, uh, I just, I just don't have it in me to do the big setup work myself, but I love what we get to see through it. And uh, I'm excited to bring to you some of the stuff that, you know, you probably never had access to using because we only have one of them in all of existence, like the Hubble Space Telescope or the James Webb Space Telescope. And uh, we have been breaking uh, all sorts of crazy new frontiers over the last year in the hunt for the most distant galaxies of all. Uh, and I'm excited to talk to you about that uh, today. All right, so real simple. How do we find the most distant galaxies? Because you know, you take a look at anywhere out there in space, you look long enough, you look deep enough, and what do you see? There's galaxies everywhere, except for the tiny few points of light that have those diffraction spikes on them. Everything in this field of view, every point of light you see is a galaxy or a cluster of galaxies or a merging set of galaxies. There's a lot of them out there, but not all of them are distant. Some are closer, some are at intermediate distances, and some are really far away. You can't just look at them and say, oh, look at this big close galaxy. I know it's close to us because of how big it looks on the sky. And look at the other ones in the background. Those are farther away. It turns out that not all of them are. Some of them are just really small. Some of these galaxies are just little galaxies that are just as close or even closer as this big NGC 7331 in this picture. So you can't rely on visual things because it's not like you're looking at a universe full of 60 watt light bulbs. And if you just see it and it's dimmer, that means it's farther away. Nope, some things have very different intrinsic brightnesses. Uh, similarly, for something like this, um, this can be overwhelming. This is a beautiful shot of a nearby cluster of galaxies that many of you have seen, I'm sure, called the Coma Cluster. And, uh, you know, as great as it looks, um, Wow, there's a whole lot to be confused here. Stars in the Milky Way, galaxies behind the cluster, uh, and at all sorts of distances. So if you want to identify distant galaxies, your first step is you have to understand what you're looking at. Here you can see uh, our six different objects. These are representations of the six different types of objects you will find in the Messier catalog. Type number one is a collection of stars, uh, which you might also know as an open star cluster, or in the cases of a couple of Messier objects, just a few chance groupings of stars. Um, in two, you see our globular clusters. These are tiny little collections in volume, but large collections in mass and stars of, of stellar phenomena there. Uh, number three is planetary nebulae. These are sun-like stars that are blown off their outer layers and are contracting down to white dwarfs. Uh, and we see a few of these in our galaxy too. Number four is a star-forming nebula. 
This is, uh, this is a beautiful one that you can see both the reflection features in blue and the uh, emission features in red. Um, and we have these all over our galaxy and we see them in other relatively nearby galaxies too. But number five and six are bona fide galaxies. These are, they were originally called spiral and elliptical nebulae. They then became known as island universes and today we call them galaxies. They come in spiral and elliptical varieties and everything else rings, what have you not, uh, we classify as irregular because they're mostly spirals and ellipticals. All right. Then you also have to recognize, oh, if we're looking for the most distant things of all, I'm going to want to look for these very distant galaxies, but I have to understand how my universe is structured, that I have Earth as part of the solar system, and our solar system goes around one star in our stellar neighborhood, and that stellar neighborhood is just one small in-between-the-arms kind of thing in the Milky Way, and that's just one galaxy out of, we now know, hundreds in the local group. And then this galaxy group, the local group, is just a small, small galactic group on the outskirts of the Virgo cluster, some 55 million light years away. And that's just part of a larger supercluster that's part of a network of local superclusters that's part of the larger observable universe. But... Even that is not the full story. That's just the story of how far away things are. Because we also have to recognize where our universe came from. That it started with this Big Bang. And so it's been expanding and cooling and gravitating and clumping together ever since. So when we look farther and farther and farther away, because there was a moment in time when our observable universe as we know it came into existence some 13.8 billion years ago, that means as time goes on and the universe expands and cools and gravitates and clumps uh, and, and continues to do its thing, we're going to see it evolve with time. So if I can see light from objects farther away, I'm seeing them a long time ago because They've, there's only been 13.8 billion years since the Big Bang started. There's however much time until that object came to be the way it is when it emitted that light and for that light to travel across the universe and reach us now. So when we look farther and farther away, we're looking farther and farther back towards the Big Bang in time. And this is something that is very interesting for us because if we want to see the most distant galaxies of all, that tells us we're going to be looking for galaxies back closest to the Big Bang. So when we see galaxies like we do today in our universe in this last balloon, we're seeing things as they are when they're, you know, highly evolved, when they've spread out in distance, when they've had time to collect gas and grow stars and recycle them for generations and draw in intergalactic matter and evolve in all these ways that galaxies evolve over time. But as we look back to earlier and earlier times, to more and more distant galaxies, we think see them as they were back then when they were smaller and closer together and less evolved and less massive. And this should continue as far back as we can see them, ideally until the very first ones existed and then none before that. But we also have to realize that the light we see the farther and farther away we look is different than the light we see from something nearby. And that's because of this phenomenon, that as the universe expands, it also cools. The reason the universe cools as it expands is because light, you'll remember, like the photons that fill the universe that you use to take its temperature, blah, 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 it has a specific wavelength. Light comes in a set of wavelengths. And that wavelength, you know, you say, oh, yeah, I know like stars emit light with a black body spectrum of wavelengths, roughly. And that corresponds to a specific temperature. So I can classify stars by their temperature. Well, kind of. When you see a star that isn't moving towards or away from you and the space between you and that star isn't a stretching or contracting, yeah, that light stays the same wavelength. 
But as our universe expands, the wavelength of light that travels through it gets stretched by the expansion of space as it travels from where it was created to where we're going to observe it. And that stretching of the wavelength of light causes it to do what we call redshift or shift towards redder and redder or longer and longer wavelengths. But this is something we can use. Our picture of it now is how does this work? Well, for any galaxy that emits light, you have a galaxy that emits light at a certain point in time, and that light is going to start its journey towards where we're going to be when it arrives. As the light travels through the universe and the fabric of the universe expands due to cosmic expansion, due to the Hubble expansion, that wavelength is going to stretch and light that was originally, say, yellow, uh, like you see in the example here for sodium emission that has those two narrow yellow lines, right? You see those two narrow yellow lines, they stretch and they redshift and as that light is on the way it now has changed from yellow to orange and then as it gets closer and closer it stretches more and becomes redder and by time it gets to us sometimes that light is red sometimes that light's already in the infrared and you can't even see it in visible light anymore so we have to be aware of this that the galaxies we see that are far away from us are going to have their light that we see from them shifted towards the red. And the faster the galaxy is away, the farther away it is from us, and the more the universe expands while that light takes its journey, the farther and farther and farther towards the red and into the infrared that light is going to be shifted. And this is really great for us because we take one deep image of a region of space, we're going to see all sorts of interesting things in there. You can see, oh, we'll have a star and relative to how atomic or molecular emission and absorption lines appear, you can say, oh, well, I know what elements these are in the laboratory and I see the ratio of the different lines at the different wavelengths and I know what sort of sets of elements I have. And then I say, oh, well, look at this star. I can take its spectrum and I can identify those same elements and I'll see, dependent on whether that star is moving towards us or away from us, that wavelength might be shifted by a small amount, by an amount corresponding to a few tens or hundreds of kilometers a second. Probably not more than that. But if I look at galaxies, what I'm going to find overwhelmingly is that the nearby galaxies are going to be redshifted a little bit. The more distant galaxies are going to be redshifted by a greater amount. And in fact, it's basically going to look like a galaxy is speeding away from us directly proportionally to how far away it is from us. That was the basic original version of Hubble's law. Over time, we've measured things out to great enough distances that we know, no, it isn't a perfectly linear thing. In fact, it it evolves a little bit. And I don't know how well you can see from this graph that, that there is a little bit of a curve to it, that it's not perfectly straight. Um, but it's not perfectly straight. But this is good because this should be the reconstruction of the relationship between how has the universe expanded over its history versus what's theoretically the stuff that makes up the universe. Theoretically, those equations are, are linked. That's, that's just from Einstein's relativity. That's noticing the universe is the same on large scales in all directions and all locations. That's it. You get from Einstein's equation, the universe has to expand or contract. And the relationship is just between how fast it expands or contracts and how that evolves over time and all the stuff that's in the universe. So that's how we know we've got normal matter, dark matter, dark energy, a little bit of radiation and a tiny bit of neutrinos from just following this line and making these measurements, which is outstanding that we can do that. So we build up this picture of the universe, but the way we do it for any individual galaxy we want to measure is we take that galaxy's light 
and we break it up into those individual wavelengths, just like you would by passing visible light through a prism. It breaks it up into those different wavelengths. And if you can monitor that closely enough, if you can be, um, you know, I'll say precise enough with your measurements, you can actually measure if there are dips in the light that you see because you have cold molecules or atoms that absorb that light, or you can see bright spikes in light because you have these bright emission lines that come from excited atoms, ions, or molecules. So either one of those absorption or emission lines you can use as like a fingerprint to tell you not only what elements are in this galaxy, but how much has the universe expanded from the time this galaxy emitted its light all that time ago to when you're observing that light now. And that's the key point with how we do it. So I'll tell you how we did it with two great steps. First, with the Hubble Space Telescope, which gave us our first real impressive glimpse into the ultra distant universe. And then with the James Webb Space Telescope, which I still have a hard time believing with all that's come out of it, that it has been doing science operations for only 10 months now, for not even one year. All of the riches that have come out of it have been over that, that short of a period of time. So let's start with Hubble. One of my favorite things they did with Hubble, after they corrected the original flaw in the primary mirror, after they had CoStar, they had a servicing mission and they put the corrected, you know, cameras and equipment and lenses, they put all the corrective stuff on there and they had a brand new camera, the Wide Field Planetary Camera 2, which was uh, like the greatest thing ever. Well, they decided with director's discretionary time, and by the way, the director at the time took a tremendous amount of heat for doing this, said, I want to take uh, a large, large amount of time. I think it was the equivalent of like a week or a week and a half of observing time. And I want to stare at this patch of sky that is remarkable because it has nothing in it. It has nothing known in it at all. It has like, oh, maybe like one or two faint stars that are known to be in the Milky Way, but we don't know of any galaxies, any dust, any nebulae, nothing in that little patch of sky. So let's have Hubble look at it for however much time we can get. And people were like, oh, you're just going to observe nothing really well. Are you going to see the noise floor of your telescope? Or it's not going to work at all and you're just going to get one oversaturated pixel covering the whole thing. And when they finally unblinded the data, this is what they saw. And that sort of justified everything to everyone and made us say, oh, my goodness, it is full of galaxies. It really is full Anywhere you go, any line of sight, you go long enough and you're going to hit one of these things. And isn't that really, really amazing? Well, it turns out that this isn't even the deepest view of the universe we've ever gotten. That is a small portion of what you can see in this image. Well, with Hubble, they imaged this larger square field of view the Hubble Ultra Deep Field for a total of 11 days of observations. And that even smaller portion of it, the Extreme Deep Field, has a cumulative 23 days of observations. And it's in this area that we know some of the most distant objects we've ever seen are, some of the most distant confirmed objects are. But we know these can't be the most distant ones of all. Why? because Hubble can't see them. Hubble can't see the most distant objects of all, and we know this. Why? Well, one reason is this. Hubble primarily is an optical and near-infrared telescope. It does a little ultraviolet too, but it's primarily optical and near-infrared. And the farther away you look in the universe, the farther back in time you look to this era where reionization was occurring. 
This is one of those maddening things in astronomy where something was ionized and that's bad. And then it became neutral and that was good. And then it stayed neutral and that was bad. And it had to become ionized again for us to see through it. What am I talking about? Well, you have the Big Bang, everything is a hot, dense plasma. And for 380,000 years, it's too hot to form neutral atoms because your atomic nuclei and your electrons are in this bath of photons. And even though the photon temperature is way below the equivalent temperature of that 13.6 electron volt threshold you need to ionize neutral ground state hydrogen, there are so many more photons in the universe, more than a billion photons for every atom in the universe, that even at lower temperatures corresponding to only a few thousand Kelvin, these high energy photons at the very end of the photon tail are enough in number that they keep scattering off of the electrons. They keep this plasma in thermal equilibrium. They keep everything scattering off of one another. And that's important for our universe because what it does is it prevents gravitational growth from really proceeding in any efficient sort of matter. It, it constrains how rapidly small scale structure goes. And that's why the big peak in density and the reason we form structure on a certain cosmic scale first is because, yeah, on larger scales, it takes a long time for gravity to go from one end to the other, and it can't collapse until enough cosmic time has passed for a gravitational signal to cross these big cosmic scales. But on too small of a cosmic scale, you've had electron photon scattering washing out all of your early structure. That's why we think we form structure first in these somewhere between like 100,000 to 1 billion solar mass halos. Somewhere in that range, that's the mass scale, which is the sweet spot that the universe doesn't wash out the structure and it doesn't take too long for gravity to start collapsing things. So that's what we could expect if we could ever see back to the truly first stars and galaxies. But then you get this problem that you make them, you make these first stars, you make these first galaxies, and they're surrounded by neutral atoms. And what do neutral atoms do? They block light. Neutral atoms, if they make dust, if they clump together, if they make molecules, they can block light. Visible ultraviolet infrared, more efficient at shorter wavelengths, less efficient at long wavelengths. So what you need to do is wait for enough stars, enough hot ultraviolet emitting stars to form to ionize the universe that you can see through it. So Hubble's limited not only by the redshift range that it can offer, that it can reach, but also by the fact that the farther back it tries to look, it's trying to penetrate this dust and it has the wrong wavelength eyes for that. It's looking at these bluer wavelengths. It's looking, it needs to be looking more in the infrared to find the stuff that would have gone through the dust that still remained and still made it to its eyes and be able to see it. Hubble had a few brushes with the cosmic record for this over the years. It had a uh, record that it set in 2016 when it's found a galaxy at a redshift of 11.1. .1. That corresponds to a time just about 400, 410 million years after the hot Big Bang. But it was only able to see that specific galaxy that far away because it was on a serendipitously greater than average line of sight as far as reionization went. The universe doesn't reionize uniformly. Wherever you have big pockets of stars forming earlier, you're gonna reionize more things. And we just happen to see through more holes in the Swiss cheese on the way back to that one particular galaxy than in most other things. So for the last seven years, that was the most distant galaxy Hubble had found. Um, but here's why Hubble's limited, not just because of that dust, but because even with the best of Hubble's instruments, it can only see a little bit into the near infrared. Hubble's different instruments really allow it to see from about, about ultraviolet 150, 100, 150 nanometers 
all the way up to about 2,400 nanometers or 2.4 microns. Uh, with its current instrumentation, it sees to about 1.6 microns. Uh, but this is great. Even with Hubble, we were able to map out how galaxies evolved from 400 million years after the Big Bang until today. We got to really learn all this information about how our universe grew up to make galaxies like that. But you know, astronomers, we always want to go over that next frontier. We always want to see what's next, what's beyond the current limit of our instrumentation. What are we missing out on? Because these earliest galaxies that we saw, they are not pristine. They are already well evolved and massive and full of heavy elements that indicate previous generations of stars. Because that's what we want. We want the first galaxies. We want pristine galaxies. We want to know where does that boundary between where you have galaxies and where you don't, where does that end? Well, the way to solve that is with the James Webb Space Telescope. Just take a look at the scale on the bottom of the chart here. And you'll see, remember, Hubble limit was about 2.4 microns. The middle of what you see is the K band over there. Well, the near infrared goes out to five microns. And not only can the James Webb Space Telescope do out to five microns, it can do spectroscopy on out to five microns. So it can see more than twice as distant, more than twice to as great a redshift as Hubble could. And it also has a mid-infrared instrument that it can image out at wavelengths up to six times longer than the limits of the near-infrared into the mid-infrared. This is where it gets really powerful. That was why the moment they unveiled the first image from James Webb Space Telescope, and this is what we got to see a look into, we knew, oh, there's a good chance that in this first image, some of these galaxies are more distant than Hubble's all-time distant record. They tested their spectroscopic instruments with the first release on four of these galaxies. They didn't break the cosmic record. They only saw back to 700 million years after the Big Bang, but they were able to find both hydrogen and oxygen emission lines in the spectrum there. And that's incredibly powerful because a lot of the Hubble spectra we were taking, we only had one line, the Lyman break. That was it. We had one line. But now we don't have to do that because James Webb is so large and its instruments are so sensitive that when we get a good photometric candidate, first off, what does that look like? Well, with James Webb, when it does near-infrared photometry, it has, check this out, it has eight or nine different wavelength bands that it can check. And it can take all of these things and say, oh, I'm an excellent photometric candidate for being a high redshift galaxy. Don't trust anyone yet. Maybe someday they'll be able to do this. But don't ever trust anyone that says, I have a photometric galaxy to, tell, to sell you. Uh, because a photometric redshift is something you should trust as much as a photo of the Loch Ness Monster. A photometric redshift is a great thing for identifying a galaxy candidate. But just from photometry, you can't tell is, am I seeing nothing at short wavelengths and nothing at short wavelengths and nothing at short wavelengths and then a bunch of stuff at longer wavelengths because this is my Lyman break and then I have a galaxy out there? Or do I have a galaxy whose Lyman break is way back here, but the galaxy is red and dusty and then has bright emission lines after that propping that photometry up. And you might say of that second scenario, oh, Ethan, come on, that's not likely. What are the odds of that? And I'm like, take your pick. 
Here on the left, I can show you spectra of galaxies taken with JWST that were excellent photometric high redshift candidates that turned out to be spectroscopically confirmed at high redshift. And here on the right, we have a very similar set of galaxy candidates that all turned out not to be at high redshift. They are at lower redshift, but they're red and dusty with bright, strong emission lines propping up the magnitude at longer wavelengths. So um, that's why we have to do spectroscopy because we don't guess and we don't say, oh, we have candidates, let's move on. No, we wanna know because we wanna break up the light and we wanna study the ones that pass the test because this is our glimpse, our earliest glimpse ever into the universe observationally. Well, the current record holder is this little fella here. Uh, this is Jade's GS 13.0-0. And this is the most distant galaxy currently identified. And it's awesome. It is so young. Its light was emitted just 320 million years after the Big Bang. And it is still showing evidence of chemical enrichment and being massive and evolved. This is not a pristine galaxy. It has oxygen in it. It has evidence that previous generations of stars have lived and died. And so we don't even think this is going to be the ultimate record holder. We fully expect this record to be very temporary. Uh, galaxy GNZ11, which used to be number one until last year, until really just a few months ago, uh, is now, I believe it's either fifth or sixth in the top 10. That James Webb Space Telescope has broken that record many times. It's seen, uh, I think, something like 12 or 13 galaxies in the first 500 million years of the universe, which is amazing. And a whole bunch of it, you know, if you zoom in on a random region of this, this is what it's going to look like. This represents 2% of the Sears survey, uh, which is the something catalog for early evolution, release galaxy, something like that. Uh, but there were three big ones. That one, the uh, Pandora's Cluster study, and the uh, Undercover study that did uh, Abel, uh, no, the undercover study, sorry. Um, well, they they have three groups. Sorry, the Jades group is the other one. Uh, the undercover survey is the Pandora's cluster one. Um, those three early surveys, they took about the same region of sky. This image you're seeing represents 2% of the Sears area. And for all of this, you take photometry for every one of those galaxies, and then you choose which which one is the most important to follow up with spectroscopy because you can't measure them all. We don't, we don't have the tools for that, but that just goes to show you how much of the universe we're still leaving on the table with James Webb data. Cause we don't have the power to do like wide field spectroscopy on everything instantly. Uh, if we could good, my, wow, I would love that. So how's the hunt going? Well, this is the name of the new record holder, Jade's GSZ-13-0. It has a redshift of 13.20 from an age of the universe of 320 million years and whose distance from Earth right now is 33.6 billion light years in the fabric of the expanding universe. We also see many early galaxies from within the first 500 million years. But, and this is the most important part to me, even these ultra distant galaxies are not the very first ones. They are all still the earliest ones we found, rich in heavy elements, high in mass, full of dust, evidence that they had stars before the generation we're seeing now. Same thing from the Pandora's cluster study. Um, now here's why I get really excited. The two biggest, widest area first year JWST programs are panoramic, whose area you can see on the left. If you remember, I showed you the extreme deep field with the ultra deep field around it. That's how big that is compared to the Goods North field, compared to the Hubble legacy field, 
and panorama is going panoramic is going to image the Hubble legacy field for JWST. So we're going to get a really large area on the sky. And you can also see in a different program, there's the Cosmos Web program, now shortened to 1B because they want to map out the cosmic web with it. But their graphics still have two Bs, so I used it. And uh, you can see with so much more area and more observing time devoted to these, we can fully expect that this cosmic record we have now will not stand for very long. But our ultimate goal is this. Our ultimate goal is to find the very, very first stars, the ones that are pristine, made of hydrogen and helium only, that live only for maybe one or two million years, if that, that die in fantastic explosions or maybe just implode to black holes directly. Um, if we could find that, that first pristine population of stars or galaxies, it would, it would be the biggest advance in astronomy probably since we discovered dark energy in the late 1990s. So in summary, James Webb Space Telescope's Jade's GS-13 O broke Hubble's all-time record. It is now the farthest galaxy ever seen from just 320 million years after the Big Bang. Hubble's old record holder from 2016 to 2022, RIP, is only number five on the all-time list and sinking because James Webb Space Telescope is continuing to release data from its first year of science operations and teams are continuing to do spectroscopic follow-up from the ground on them. And they are continuing to find some of these galaxies really are ultra distant, but none has broken the Jade's record set last year. But the largest, deepest James Webb Space Telescope surveys are still unreleased. And all of this has been done in less than one year of James Webb Space Telescope science operations. I have a feeling that all of the best, earliest galaxies are still to come. And if you're wondering, hey, are any of these galaxies clustered together? Yeah, James Webb Space Telescope just found these galaxies all co-located in space uh, at a redshift of eight point something, uh, making this the most distant galaxy cluster ever found. In fact, it's still a proto cluster just becoming gravitationally bound right now. Um, so galaxies, galaxy clusters galore, but not the first stars just yet. But I think that's a great place to end with hunting for the first galaxies, how far we've come and what we're looking ahead to. Thanks very much for listening. Thanks. This was great. Fantastic. Very good. I have a question. Sure. Do you, uh, well, just as a general, do you write for Forbes? Uh, I did write for Forbes. So I wrote from Forbes from 2015 to 2021. Uh, and then in 2021, I got hired away by Big Think, who said, come write for us. And I said, what are your terms? And they said, how about this? And I said, no, how about this? And they said, okay. And so I stopped writing for Forbes and I've been writing for Big Think ever since. Okay, very good. Now, you one of your one of your um, <clears throat> graphs in there that showed the Hubble on the bottom. The bottom line, it, it had something to do with lambda cold dark matter. I, I I was trying to figure that out, and then you changed the slide. Um, Hang on, I'll try and pull it up for you. Um, I was just trying to interpret what you were, what that graph was saying. What, let me see if it was this one. Was it this one? Oh, I'm not even sharing my screen. Ha ha. Yeah. Sorry, fooled you all. Let me try that again. That's was it this one. one? Yeah. What's okay. that? What's that mu minus mu lambda cold dark? Matter? So this is this is a this is a combination the mu is basically saying we're going to take the bolometric uh, magnitude in solar luminosities and subtract from it this calibrated distance modulus 
Um, and then these are two other factors that you relate. Uh, these are the stretch factors for type 1A supernovae. Um, and so then this is the plot of supernovae where they fall on the redshift versus this is the equivalent of a, of a apparent magnitude. Uh, and so they graph apparent magnitude versus redshift. And this black line you see isn't a fit to the data. The black line is the Lambda CDM model with the ratios of dark matter and dark energy that we've inferred. And so what you see down at the bottom are the residuals from what happens if you take this okay. supernova data and you bin it as a function of magnitude versus redshift and you compare the residuals with how well does it fit with lambda CDM. And so if these error bars are within the zero thing, you say that's pretty good. And if they miss, you say, I don't trust this. So that's what that's what the graph is showing you. Okay, I'm just uh, okay. I know that uh, well, I know that you're a dark matter guy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, uh, well, I, I I don't I don't have to pretend not to be. I uh, I I am I a dark matter that guy. Something to do with uh, convergence. I uh, I just. I know it's something I just don't understand, and I try to try to look it up and learn some, but uh, I oh, I've done too too many other things to. Well, think. I'm sorry, man. If I had known, I would have given a talk on dark matter instead of this boring stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Ethan, uh, you, you talked about uh, determining redshift photometrically versus spectroscopically. I, I know there are a lot of different uh, algorithms for for doing photometry to determine mm -hmm. redshift. But I wasn't aware that they could be. Uh, if I understood you correctly, they could be way off. Well, I the mean, problem is, and and this is this is really getting subtle about it. But the problem is when you start talking about photometry, you learn a lot when you do photometry over time with the same equipment and the same conditions. So when we first started seeing galaxies at a redshift of like two and three, when we started seeing that far, there were all sorts of ways that our previous photometric techniques, when we applied them, wound up fooling us at high redshift because we didn't know about blue compact galaxies and we didn't know about uh, how the Lyman Alpha Forest and the Gunn-Peterson trough at higher redshifts would start wiping things out. Um, and so we had to learn as we went to those higher and higher redshifts in large numbers. Now, we think we understand pretty well what's going on with photometry out to a redshift of three or four. If you give me a galaxy with only its photometry information, I can categorize what its redshift's going to be very reliably now, much more reliably than I could have done 20 or 25 years ago with technology then. But now we're getting into this territory where people are trying to take what we expect from photometry and trying to infer what's happening at a redshift of 10 or 15. And, whoa, like we've seen we, we can't do that we have we don't have the experience with these filters at these wavelengths knowing how they're populated at these sensitivities with different types of you know wavelength emitting and absorbing things that are out there so for example i talked about how you could have a galaxy that photometrically it looks like nothing, 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 a ton, a ton, a ton. Well, if you had a dusty galaxy, a dusty galaxy isn't going to be sharp like that. It's going to be gradual like, like this. But if you're not seeing that low wipeout and you're really only coming in and you see this low equilibrium, right? Well, you just have your noise floor for any observation. So that's that could be something that with more experience, we know how to separate those two out, but right now we don't. So then when you start to see, oh, uh, I'm not seeing a rise, well, is that because there's extra dust there extincting that, or is it because there's still neutral matter that still isn't reionized because we're this far behind the Gunn-Peterson trough? Or, you know, so there could be 
artificial ways to wipe out that intermediate wavelength stuff. And then at higher wavelengths, there's artificial ways to inflate it. For example, if I have just a normal galaxy that isn't particularly hot or ionized, I'm going to see a gradual rise. But if I have a gradual rise with a big O3 emission line and a big H beta emission line and a big, right? If I have these big emission lines that come out here and I only do photometry on this range, then even though most of it was like this, but I've got a spike here, it artificially inflates it. So I can be, so, so that's how photometry can fool me at these high red shifts. And I brought that one example up because I was able to show you four spectra from JWST galaxies that actually look like, oh, that's how they fooled our photometry. But what that revealed was something actually interesting. They're all at the same redshift. That's probably a proto-galaxy cluster we're finding. So, you know, JWST giveth and JWST taketh away. <laughs> so speaking of, of giving and taking away, the, the um, Ethan is uh, publishes on uh, Medium. Ethan, you could add the other ones. Uh, he's got a Patreon site where he publishes. Uh, both of those uh, give you interaction. You can interact. You can ask him questions or make comments, and he might every once in a while comment back. Okay, But he definitely will change. I don't know what rate you publish at. I'm guessing... I, I publish a lot. I publish about five articles a week, yes. and I do a monthly <laughs> podcast, and... Uh, I'm also uh, writing a few books, uh, which I'm very excited about. Something that I fully expect to come out later this year is a project I'm working on with a couple of space artists, John Lomberg, who you might have heard of. He did the art for Carl yeah. Sagan's original Cosmos, and Mark Garlick, who's one of the top uh, space artists in the UK. Uh, we're teaming up, and I'm writing, and they're illustrating an Encyclopedia Cosmologica where every time you turn the page, you come forward from before the Big Bang 100 million years in time until you get to the present day. Uh, and I'm writing each chapter, and they're illustrating it, uh, and we're really going to finish because the whole thing is going to 13.8 billion years, and I just wrote that chapter on Thursday. So it's really going to happen. So that'd be cool. The... the um uh, in terms of the uh, uh, the medium stuff, uh, if y'all want to get into dark matter um, and dark energy, uh, Ethan uh, published one in the last two weeks, I think, or three. I can't I can't even keep track of which ones, uh, but but uh, he's got a number of uh, extremely interesting uh, analyses of. of of how uh, all this stuff works with respect to dark energy and dark matter, particularly gravitational effects and on light and so forth and so on. Well, thanks. I I have a lot of fun writing about this stuff, and yeah, uh, I'm my brand is starts with a bang. Uh, so if you search for that, uh, I'm at Medium. I'm on Big Think. I'm on Patreon. Um, and if you're looking for uh, Anything, anything I did about dark matter and dark energy, I think I've got a couple of links I can drop in the uh, in the chat for you that are pretty recent. So here's one about dark matter uh, that was a claim about whether gravitational lensing can reveal that it's made of wimps or axions, uh, and this is one about how does dark energy accelerate the universe. So is, I'm just sort of curious, are WIMPs dead now? No, they're not dead. But, you know, for a lot of reasons, people were biased towards favoring them. And I would say there isn't any evidence favoring them anymore. Like, they're, they're an idea, and they're a valid idea, and it's fine to keep looking. But let's not expect we're going to find it. You should always look where you've never looked before. But you shouldn't expect you're going to find something just because you want it to be there. Ethan. Yes. A quick question. Okay. Not counting for the fact that the Milky Way is in the way, if you could look through the Milky Way in any direction in the universe, the web, you're going to find, if you look hard enough, 
very distant galaxies in every direction. It's not like they're one part of the sky or, and not in the other, right? Not accounting for things getting in the way. On, on large scales, that's true, right? The larger a scale you look at, the more uniform the universe gets, right? If you, if you, if you dip a coffee cup into the cosmic ocean, you're going to get all or nothing. But if you if your dipper is a hundred, you know, if your dipper is 10 billion light years on the side, you're going to scoop up the same amount of stuff. Right. The, the reason I'm asking is a very common question I get at star parties is where did the big bang happen? We look out into the universe. Did it happen in some location in our universe? And I'm trying to explain to them that the, every, the, the big bang is everywhere. And that's, that's the hard part. Well, the way I like to think about the big bang is the Big Bang happened a certain amount of time ago here. But the farther away you look, the Big Bang happened less long ago there because you're seeing it as, okay, here I'm seeing you 13.8 billion years after the Big Bang. But when I see something where the light took a billion years to travel from it to my eye, I'm seeing it in a spherical shell around me as it was when it was only 12.8 okay. billion years ago. And when I take light that's been on a journey for 10 billion years, then I have an even bigger sphere that corresponds to when the universe was just 3.8 billion years ago. And when I look at it at the distance of Jade's GS GSZ 13.0, uh, then I see things as they were when the universe was just 320 million years old. And so I would say, if you really want to get technical about it, the Big Bang happened 46.1 billion light years away in a spherical shell centered almost but not quite on you. Right. Thank you. That's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I, have one right. I think I've got time for, for one or two more. Well, a few. I would appreciate. I would like to hear, see something that, you know, it's either you're all dark matter or you're mond, and people don't believe in mond. But I, there are a lot of things believable about mond, that you know, that answer questions that nobody seems to want to answer and give a comparison to what seems to be right with that versus dark matter, and. And, every, and and the the only answers that I seem to get is well, we could we could talk about the effects of something that we don't know that exists, or you, well, you assume so, it exists. So the way the way I would say because it seems like you're basically saying, Ethan, convince me, tell me something convincing to yeah, tell right. me why it's dark matter and why it's not change the law of gravity. Well, okay, yeah, I'll not, try. I'll try. Sure. So if I say, look, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to look at galaxies and I'm going to look at them rotate and I'm going to watch them go. I'm going to watch uh, how they swarm around and have velocity dispersion in elliptical galaxies. I'm going to look at differential rotation in edge on galaxies. I'm going to look at combination of differential rotation and some other surface effects on slightly inclined galaxies. Guess what? I can fit them all with this Mond law. All I have to do is say, instead of having the gravitational acceleration be inversely proportional to distance squared, right, to have it, to have it work the way, you know, you learn from Newton's laws, I'm going to throw in a term at low accelerations where I replace my normal acceleration with the square root of a plus a naught squared. So I have this a naught term, this, this minimal acceleration term, right? And, and I'm going to throw that in there. And I find if I try to say, well, look, I did a simulation of the universe was filled with dark matter particles and I got a few different things out of it, right? I got my large cosmic filamentary web on cosmic distance scales, complete with like galaxy clustering features. And I have galaxy clusters and the individual galaxies in them zoom around and zip around. And I have these little itty bitty galaxies and satellite galaxies and individual stars zip around in them. And I measure the cosmic scale clustering. I measure the speeds of the galaxies moving in the galaxy clusters. And I measure what's going on here in the individual galaxies. And for dark matter, 
I do these perfectly. I do the galaxy speeds and the clusters perfectly. And then for these, uh, I'm a little bit too peaky in the core and I fall off at slightly the wrong rate at the outskirts. So dark matter, people who work on that, that's the problem area for them. They say this scale works great on the cosmic web. This scale works great on galaxy clusters. But as I start to get to small scales, I need to start worrying, am I doing this right? When I form stars, for instance, oh, that's matter converting into energy and emitting radiation and pushing back on the normal matter. And I have to put that feedback effect in there. And I have to see how that affects the dark matter that's accumulated all throughout the galaxy. And that's very hard to simulate. And I'm not that good at it. So that's kind of the problem area for dark matter. But here's what gets me about MOND. You can make that law for galaxies and you can look at galaxy after galaxy on this cosmic scale and you can be like, Mond does better. It just does better across the board. And that's the feather in Mond's cap. But then you say, I wanna take that same law, that same gravitational acceleration law and apply it to galaxy clusters and it's way low, it's way wrong. It gives you the wrong acceleration. You would need a different modification to your law of gravity to explain the clusters. The modification you make to explain clusters can't explain this at all. And then when you look at the big cosmic web scale, this for me is the real killer. Not only do you still need a third different modification from the galaxy cluster scale and the individual galaxy scale, but if you look at the cosmic web scale, the only modification to gravity that works is a modification of gravity that's indistinguishable from behaving like particle dark matter. Sure, yeah, I understand And that. so for me, if you have to say, look how good Mond works over here, but I also need dark matter over here, or maybe it's just dark matter and I have to do some hard math, I'm going to bet on maybe it's just dark matter. I don't, I'm not a fan of why not both. No, pick the best one. <laughs> well, yes, I, I understand. So that's, where that's, my, that's, my, that's the five-minute version of a longer <laughs> talk I did. Yeah, yeah, I understand. That's a very complicated <laughs> thing. But, uh, you know, the thing that, that uh, I like about a lot of papers that are published about Mond are, are, is it, it is a predictor, and it, it is – and and uh, dark matter has a lot of failings in in that in that area. It doesn't predict well. Sure, you point at any one galaxy, and Mon can do a good job. And if you want to have someone who does that with Mon, come give a talk to your club. Uh, there are many names you can you can find <laughs> who will be happy to do that. Uh, well, sure, and they will I'm show sure. you I'm galaxy just, after just, galaxy after galaxy, I'm, and rotation curve after rotation yeah, curve, and this beautiful plane of alignment of satellite galaxies. Um, <laughs> yeah, they, I, I they, it's, I it's, a, it's a very good story. I understand that, that part. It's, it's complicated, yes. It's very complicated, and then Instead of you saying it, it's very, or as dark matter is very general, that the that, uh, Mon people have very specific things that they're pointing out. And yes, I understand that. But I'm just trying to resolve the differences between the two, which is very difficult at my level. Well, I'm, a, I'm a large scale cosmologist. Like I look at the universe on the largest scale. So if I try, you, you can try and argue with me about what kind of tree this is from its bark, but don't tell me it's not a forest. <laughs> All right. Are there any other questions? Greg, well, you one more question. It's like you're mute, muted. Yes. Uh, thank you. I, I think um, I, I appreciate the talk. I, I'm not an astrophysicist, but I played one in a high school play one time. But no. <laughs> so I, I think to a certain extent, um, the last question was getting at this. But uh, it seems as though that uh, these extremely young galaxies, just several hundred million years after the Big Bang, that are already several generations into, you know, uh, you know uh, 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 metal formation, et cetera, 
uh, do have serious implications for um, dark matter. And I think this is sort of what you were covering, covering there, that, that for that amount of baryonic matter to coalesce that quickly after the Big Bang, and then we know that other galaxies are only sort of only forming now or, you know, 10 billion years later after or whatever, that <clears throat> the, form the, the types of dark matter or how dark matter might have been clumped early on, you know, whatever. Uh, and we know that CMB has clumps in it and stuff like that. So th th that was sort of where I was going with that, that, that um, one would imagine that, that um, these young galaxies have, and especially since they're, since they're several generations into star formation, or these stars would have had to have been quote unquote rock stars, you know, burn bright, live fast. I young. see. Greg, so, are you yeah. asking, are these galaxies getting too big, too fast Basically. to agree <laughs> with the standard cosmological picture? That's my question. <laughs> okay. And I'm not an astrophysicist, so I think you okay. really asked the real question there. Okay. So first I'm going to drop a link in the chat to uh, because someone asked about Medium. Uh, this story appeared on Medium uh, a couple weeks ago. Oh, uh, sorry, four days ago. Uh, I, I don't even remember. Uh, <laughs> but uh, what happened was this is something people have been worried about. Like we have this theoretical expectation for how fast structure can form based on the fluctuations we see in the cosmic microwave background. The problem is our simulations, even as good as cosmological simulations are and how many particles we can fit inside and how big a cosmic scale we can simulate it on, Getting a big simulation down to small resolution size, like the size of the first stars and galaxies, we still can't do that. We still have to estimate. So this could be a problem. Is the problem that these galaxies are growing too big too fast? Or is the problem that, look, if I have a bell curve distribution of density where, you know, this is the average over density is say one part in 30,000, but 32% of them are going to be two parts in 30,000 and 0.3% of them are going to be three parts in 30,000. And, and a few of them are going to be these rarely peaked regions where you have these uncommon, but highly over dense regions. And we might not be capturing those in the simulations we've been using to simulate what types of galaxies do we expect. Someone earlier, like about a month ago, wrote a paper where they said, hey, look at this. Uh, let's take this code from this higher resolution simulation uh, that was written back in 2013 and 2015, and let's apply it to the model we've been using for James Webb Space Telescope galaxies and check it out. When you use the coarser model, you reproduce these galaxies that are lower in mass that appear at later times. But when you use the full sim set of simulations that go to those smaller scales, you find that those very rarely peaked regions, like the most overdense regions in a volume, will actually give you the greatest number of large overdense galaxies. And if you more correctly simulate those, then the disagreements between what the simulation predicts and what James Webb actually observes, it goes from being like, oh, this is like a one in a million or one in a billion unlikelihood to this is like a one in two likelihood, or this is like a one in 1.5 likelihood. Uh, and so, I'm not convinced that these very early claims of, oh my God, these galaxies are too big, too evolved, too fast, are really anything more than you didn't do your computations and calculations very carefully, did you? Um, and that if you had done them more carefully, and that as people do them more carefully, we start to see maybe this isn't a conflict at all. So I'm, I've got my mind open because maybe these galaxies really are too big, too fast. And if they are, I want to know. But... Right now, when I see the conflict in the community about what this means, uh, I'm not convinced that this is any problem at all for dark matter or Lambda CDM cosmology. Instead, I think we're just seeing, as we often do, the brightest, rarest objects first. That's just classic Malmquist bias. Thank you.
That's a very good answer. Yeah, it's a very good answer. All right. Well, thanks for having me, everyone. I'm, uh, I'm going to drop out now and enjoy the rest of your meeting and clear skies and sorry, Pittsburgh. Go Islanders. All right. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for talking to us, Ethan. Yeah. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Not to throw shade on the other presentators we've had uh, for a while, but this one brought. Yeah. Was yeah, fat. This, um, yeah, yes, yeah. he's very good. Yeah, yeah.